Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Living Fit Show. This is your host, Coach Jesse Grund, and we are delighted today to have Chris Chamberlain. Chris is the Education Director for the WEC Method. If you don't know about it, if you've ever picked up a BOSU before, that's where it all started, but it's grown into something so much more. So Chris, thank you for being on the show. How are you today? Hey, I'm doing great, man. Super excited to be here. So Nice. Well, you tell the little the viewers a little bit about you, maybe about your coaching journey and how you got to being the education director of the WEC Method. All right, man. Yeah, we're getting right to business. So Let's do uh, it. I'm Chris Chamberlain, right? I've been training for 13 plus years now. I'm originally from the East Coast around the Washington, D.C. area. So I'm an East Coaster. I got that drive, right? Um, I am uh, was actually a carpenter for the bulk of my life and kind of worked like land. I grew up on a little bit of land. So most of my physicality came from that and my love for movement came from sort of that realm or that thought process of completing practical tasks. So I think that's a big piece of how I talk to people now. Um, played a little bit of high school football, got kind of messed up in the gym a little bit with some poor coaches teaching me like Olympic weightlifting and stuff like that. Never really felt so great on me. My brother kind of was uh, four years ahead of me and was a huge guy. He's like 6'4", 240, and was like a tight end. So the coaches were kind of like looking at me the same and pushing me the same. So kind of had this weird little start to my fitness journey where I sort of kind of hated it. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. Uh, but that turned around real quick. I fell in love with the kettlebell. I ran into, uh, I think Steve Maxwell was actually probably my first kettlebell guy. So I wasn't on the Pavel ride right away. It was Steve. Uh, and then I got into kettlebells. I didn't really dive into any of the certs, but I really chased that implement sort of as a place for me to learn and grow uh, and, <clears throat> and develop a physical practice. And it sort of became my niche in the industry for probably, I mean, I guess it still is to some degree, but for literally my whole career, I, I really like backed the kettlebell. Uh, just, I really love that it, um, there's a level of just like skill development behind it. It's a little more than just grab it and go. So I think that that's a really powerful thing when somebody's developing a personal practice. Um, that sort of be my niche, kind of jumped around the country a little bit. I was East Coast, Northern Virginia, went to Denver, back to Virginia. And now I'm here in sunny California, probably for the past eight, nine, eight or nine years, I think. I think it's been wow. about that long. Um, I happened to meet a gentleman named David Weck, a good friend of mine and a good friend of his sort of uh, put us together. And it sort of kind of pushed me a little further in my career. Um, I'm here now as the director of WEC Method uh, because of that. And that sort of started because uh, when I met Dave, if anybody ever gets the opportunity to listen to anything he's been on, uh, he's a very interesting cat. Uh, he's got a lot to say and there's, uh, he's very in-depth on some stuff. So that can be a lot. Hopefully I'll be able to, if any viewer here is uh, listen to him, hopefully I can be a little more practical or a little more, maybe I can get to you in a different way than if you've ever listened to him. Uh, but basically I talked to him for an hour. We did one little practical application for about three to four minutes. And that little three to four minute, um, movement we did, it was something called the Royal coil, which we could talk about here in a little bit, but it basically just connects you to your trunk or your lat or your core a little differently than, um, uh, I had ever experienced. And I, I took that and I took it to my niche and I went right back to the gym after feeling it. And I tried it at the gym very quickly. And I set a 40 ish pound PR on my bent press with a kettlebell. And I was wow. like, Whoa, <laughs> I just felt wow. a single thing. And already at a really high level I, at that time, I would think I set a huge <laughs> uh, PR. So, uh, and what was even greater about that was that it, the whole time I talked to him, he was telling me that that was meant for running. So for me to go to the gym and set a strength PR, I was like, Ooh, mm. there's something, there's something here. So this is supposed to make me run better, but make me stronger. Like I'm for this. So I started being a fly on the wall here and sort of wedged my way in, uh, to help Dave translate all this information and create an education system and start talking about this stuff in simpler terms. So we can start getting everybody uh, to feel mm. what I felt within a couple minutes. So that's 
it fast, I guess. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. So, yeah. yeah that's, so that's now, so now I'm uh, educating, educating coaches. I get to still work with uh, everyday people and I'm working with high level athletes now. So it's a great time. So, but uh, my that's real good. passion, I guess my real passion is working with coaches. I love teaching people to go teach other people so we can help more people that way. So, What's well, uh, the famous quote by John Wooden? It's not what you know, it's what you can coach, right? So it's what yeah. we can bring out of others that's so much more important than necessarily the knowledge that we have in our head. That the knowledge is super important as as your experience. We call I like to call those light bulb moments where you yeah, do yeah. something and you're just like, ooh, that's right there. I want to do more of that. How do I incorporate that? How do I explore that? How do I go down the rabbit hole with that? Yep. So, yep. Yeah. So how did, so, so you got to a point where you, you became that fly on the wall. How did you end up developing? And we'll talk about the education system a little bit. How did the education system then start to develop? Did it start to become like this organic thing that you started to do? Or did you guys just sit down one day and said, Hey, we got to make something that we can teach and certify others in this method so that we can do it. Uh, have more coaches doing it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was definitely a combination of the two. I think uh, what's really cool about our education is that it is organic and it constantly grows and it grows faster than sometimes we can. We do have to sit down and make those like, this is what we're going to teach. And that's what I'm, I'm a little better at than Dave was. So I can come in and I can make it be something digestible for a day's event and something you can apply practically to people you're going to go home and work with. And even we have actually a lot of uh, practice, like just people that aren't professional come to our courses all the time just because they want to learn the information. And mm. I think that's because the feel of it is actually because you have, to, uh, I push the development of a personal practice. So it's really, mm. it's like you're coming, you're coming to learn it, to apply it and really mm. do it. It's not, ultimately you can walk away with a piece and just apply a piece. But uh, I, I'm trying to push the idea that everything I teach you should really sit underneath everything you already know. Mm. So uh, for me in that early development stage of it, it was me playing because we wanted to get it out so quick. It was me playing like super big catch up on my own personal practice. So I could be the ultimate practitioner of the WEC method, if you would, and sort of develop it and start finding all the little things in the nooks and crannies that needed to be presented in make it more digestible and make it more systematic and make it understandable. So did you feel your training yourself, the way you started implementing it? And by the way, if you guys are not following him, he's eroding weakness on social media and dude, you are strong. Like I see the load you move and it is impressive. And I've considered myself a strong guy. So kudos there. Okay. But did you, did you, did you feel like that, you know, you had that really bad experience as a, as a high school athlete, which, I think there's a lot of people that can speak to that. And I've actually coached high school athletes before. So I, I was one of the things I was so conscious of when I was working with my high school athletes was I'm not trying to overload these kids and break them at yeah, this yeah. stage in the game. I want them to learn how to move and have some acumen and understand rotational movement more than anything else. So did you, did you feel like that as you started implementing some of the things you learned that light bulb moment and started developing it? Cause you said the kettlebell was where you really started. Did your kettlebell practice then as a result start to change and you start to like explore what you could do with the kettlebell while implementing this at the same time? Absolutely. Yeah. So the big, I'm a creative type. I like to explore things and try to get as much out of something. I'll milk everything out of it. I can. And this sort of just opened up the doors on creativity and being able to root that creativity to something that mattered. So that idea of like running, like if this were everything I'm teaching is like sort of rooted in the idea of locomotion, swinging, throwing, that, right? So now my creative bone got like a big win because I could go back to everything I loved and try something new. And I gave myself permission to do it now. You know what I mean? I wasn't listening to what I shouldn't do. So mm. something you'll see about me and my education is I'm very much for everything. You know what I mean? Like nice. I'm very, I try to choose positive language. I want to try to keep things positive because there's more than just the physicality behind things. There's a lot of other things that go on in uh, training practice or personal practice. So, um, but yes, tons of stuff started opening up really right when I met Dave, it was kind of interesting because I was pretty strong and like the conventional lifts already. I was a very strong guy. Um, 
I was really good at the uh, gymnastics rings and I was very strong in that kind of stuff and pretty good at moving around and flowing around on the floor and stuff. But what I would say is I felt as like fit as I felt while I was doing it in my just day to day, I was kind of feeling sort of like meh. Like I didn't feel like I had that little athleticism to me that I had a couple of years prior to that. I was only 28 or something then, but I wasn't feeling that 24 athletic, like something was starting to miss. And the second thing I really picked up and what really where I played my catch up on my practice with WEC method was the, um, the rope, the rope flow. If you look into us at all, you're going to see something that stemmed from us and it's just a rope and it's just us prioritizing not rolling it or jumping it sorry not jumping it but rather rolling it mm -hmm. and uh what that does is it's sort of if you're putting time into it without knowing what our side bending or our coil position is it will start naturally pulling it, it you into that behavior mm -hmm. or into those postures so just performing the tasks because at that point that's all i know what to do they started drawing me more into these sort of like athletic postures. And I started feeling myself sort of be like, Ooh, like I'm regaining all this stuff. I feel like I had when I was like 18 mm -hmm. and uh, ultimately then I could take that information and bring it to my kettlebell. And now I'm starting to see them crisscross and I'm, mm -hmm. I'm bringing the two, I'm bringing the carryover between things now. So that, that ends up being the real, the real big thing in a WEC method practice is recognizing that the, positions and the postures we try to uh, inform people to get into or start exploring uh, ultimately provide carryover to all the things you love but most specifically walking like the thing that's mm. the most simple that we're all most likely going to be doing um, right. and that's what I love is that everything I do now is the same thing and I don't have to separate my modalities any longer they're all the same type thing and for me, that was big because I was creative and I loved exploring, which I think a lot of fitness professionals do. But even more so, I think a lot of people just getting into the getting into a movement practice, they um, they're looking for something that's just exciting to them. Whatever that thing mm -hmm. is that day that when they decide to start moving, excites them to do it. And I think that's really important and recognizing that all those things are typically good. So when I find that practice and then I can root it to something even better or even better for me is if I have that steel mace coach or I have that uh, CrossFit coach or whoever, whatever modality your it sparks your interest. I want to get under that coach and teach them my movement behavior so that they can teach CrossFit with my movement behavior. They can mm. teach steel mace with my movement behavior. So everybody's happy in that world. And I feel like we're all just getting that better dose of medicine. Yeah, that's great. I, I love hearing that there's no dogma in the method, which I think is really cool. There's too yeah. much, I would say, you know, I, I, we could have a whole episode on dogma in the fitness industry, which yeah, yeah. just to me just sells education. The only purpose behind dogma is to make you stand out to sell your education. Ultimately, whatever we teach people, they should be able to bring to whatever they enjoy, right? So if yeah, they're yeah. a football player, how do I become a better football player? What am I training to, to kind of do that? Mm -hmm. so, Absolutely. I mean, yeah. other, otherwise, what's the point? I shouldn't tell somebody, hey, these are the only things you should do ever, right? It should be, <laughs> yeah, yeah. how do I make you better at what all the stuff that you want to do, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, for me, a lot, some of that too is like, sometimes even the best movement practice is always not always the best thing for that person. <laughs> sometimes right. it's what, it, the, whatever the, the way you talk, it's your coaching. It's the way you talk to them. It's like, you know what I mean? There's, there's other things beyond like what the ideal movement and stuff is that gets people places. And I think a lot of the people with the dogma, they might have the best thing, you know what I mean? Or something, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, don't, they don't have the best way of communicating. So that can um, not open to what people really need to receive the information. So... so. <laughs> So would you say in your own practice, so obviously, and we're going to get into the education system a little yeah, bit yeah. in a second, but in your own practice, would you say that most of your training now would be, you know, if, if somebody was to break it down, sagittal, frontal, transverse, would you say you probably spend more time in rotation, transverse, mm -hmm. or, or you just, you know, those are, those are our normal dogmatic planes of motion that we learn in all of our <laughs> certifications and our grad school classes and stuff. Would you say you're more rotational based in almost all of your training? There's some component all, of it whether rotation all, or anti-rotation 
Yeah, yeah. All of my movement is rotation. Absolutely. Now, for whoever's listening, your brain is going to tell you twisting is the first thing you're going to, I think, associate with is the turning when you hear rotation. But I also want you to think about, um, if you could put it in your head, uh, torsion. Imagine just two screws, two little spirals or tornadoes moving on either side of your body. So everything for me, even when you would consider that term sagittal, is a form mm-hmm. of rotation. It's the intent in which you're torsioning in that environment. So without getting too far in that, but I just just open up the, the, the thought that all forms of movement is rotation. And right. everything you do, whether it's in the gym or not, in our We haven't really been training in a fitness facility for very long in our human (laughs) uh, experience that all of that is meant to provide carryover to something. So for some people, that's physique. But I think even under that, people are at least thinking they want to feel better. (laughs) So in general, so which generally means moving about the day, feeling better. So the carryover is that. And that is a form of rotation is all that movements rotation. So. If we, if we can even just change the thought that everything I'm doing in the gym is that and not that it's anti that would be my, uh, a positive thing, I think, because now I'm steering my feeling of every single rep I do towards movement rather than anti movement. Yeah. No, that makes that makes sense. That's a great way yeah. to look at it. I, I love yeah. that thought process. Yeah. Cool. Are you so uh, WEC? Obviously, the WEC method and uh, obviously developed from you know his first invention, which was the BOSU, which he could probably speak to a little bit more. Um, but but taking the BOSU and then expanding into the RMT club and the pulsers and the how to w- like when you came on, was it all of these modalities and you learned them all or did they kind of develop from you guys kind of teaming up and developing them kind of together, seeing some exposure that you could take the body into? Uh, I'll do the brief of David's thought on all that real quick. So Dave, after he had the Bozu ball, like great idea, right? That's mostly what it was probably at first was just a great idea. It worked out type right. thing. Um, but what that gave him the opportunity to do, cause it was such a great idea is he could, he could say, I'm going to ride that, or he could dive into his passion, which was movement. He actually cared about it, which is awesome. Right. Somebody that made something nice cares about what the, they did. Um, but he, um, he dove into the idea of like, what is actual balance? Like what is true balance? What does that mean? And I put out this thing that sort of is associated to that language. Like, what does that actually mean? So um, however long that took him, that's his journey, but he, he is sort of at some point decided that like the most important balance thing we do is locomotion, movement, mm-hmm. moving from A to B for just general thought. We'll say that's walking. That's the simplest way to talk about it, but it's a lot of different forms, but we'll say walking with balance is really powerful. So his thought process and the way he started developing tools sort of started following that line of thought. So pulsers were really the biggest thing that was designed straight for that. Um, Club came out for swinging, throwing, again, that thought of balance in that sort of environment. So the the tools and the products we develop for me and Dave and the rest of the team here, like when we're ideating and thinking about it, it's coming from that thought. There has to be this purpose behind it, under it, whether it's a good idea or not, it needs to be able to have that application. Um, so absolutely, yeah. Some of the stuff that had already been out, like even a Bozu, like we're always asking what if, how can we get closer to it? And that's why I say we're a little organic in our education is because I'm still a student. I'm still learning. Dave's still a student. We don't think we know everything. We're still chasing information and we're even challenging our own ideas, which I think is really important. So, uh, and that you have to keep, um, got to keep an open mind in that. And I think me, Dave sort of become this perfect compliment because we can challenge each other and we can check some balance a little bit with that thought where when Dave was on his own, it was a little slower to push along because he had no one to kind of help mm. bounce ideas off of challenge ideas. He could, cause when you feel something, you feel it's right. You're going to chase it, but you might chase yourself into a corner if somebody doesn't, um, check you a little bit and pull it back and see challenge the idea a little bit so absolutely everything we put out is based off of that thought and has that underneath of it so 
that's that's really cool. So uh, so going into rotational movement and talking about the education system a little bit, I, mm-hmm. I tend to see from a fitness professional standpoint that a lot of fit pros either a don't understand how rotational movement's supposed to work. And, and B that also leads them to either a improperly applying it or B just literally just avoiding it because they just don't necessarily understand it or understand its importance. So you guys have developed an entire system on how to rotational do rotational movement training. Can you Mm -hmm. talk a little bit about that system and about some of the concepts that are within that system and why it's so beneficial for, for education? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, we've, uh, currently our, 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 First level of education we do, it's called the Rotational Movement Training Instructor Course. So, wow, we're going to learn rotational movement, right? Uh, for us, the defini- definition of that comes from something we call a coil. If you're listening or whatever, that would essentially be a side bend. Like, it's just side bending with just some external cueing. So the thought, uh, the reason we determine that this position is something you can hit, it really comes from watching a lot of behavior through high level running, high level swinging, high level throwing, a lot of functional movement behavior. You start seeing athletes, people in all realms sort of hit these sort of positions or postures that we are now going to educate and push and open the doors and say, it's okay, give you permission to find this and define this as rotation now. So we're essentially redefining what rotation is. And what I, you had just said, sort of like, you think maybe professionals aren't quite sure what rotation is when they're doing it. They're doing a twist. They're thinking like, okay, I'm rotating. Sure, you're twisting, you're rotating, yes. But um, the big factor that we're adding in is the external cueing. And that's, Mm -hmm. again, the intention and thought that this is meant to carry over to something. So I think we get caught up sometimes in the gym and we're doing the thing in the gym or I'm doing the exercise and am I doing the exercise right? And I think there's a lot of right ways to do the exercise. But the most important thing is that for me is that the exercise has the external cue for the carryover that I want. So for us, we just will blanket that and say that it's going to be moving forward, which means if I'm going to walk forward, I want to see where I'm going. So number one, it would be your eyes are on something. There's a specific target ahead of you, that forward thought or forward intent. And then what you'll start noticing, if you can keep that sort of constraint of the eyes, it'll start dictating how all of your, how all of your joints will line up and set up as you perform an exercise, which ultimately you'll start feeling that if you can create this little contraction or side bend, you can sort of make all of those points get a little closer to what that target is or that external cue, which is forward, right? Uh, so it, it really, as we've been exploring that, like since I've got here and Dave's been exploring for years and we're just pushing it along further and further and further, we start noticing what those positions and what those postures are that get you closer to that external cue. And then you start looking... And because of slow-mo footage and things like that, where you can start really analyzing how people move through really complex behavior, which just wasn't something you could do very long ago at such an accessible way, you're able to really just see people move through all this stuff. And for our education system, this is where it's really cool because, uh, and this is why I say it's really cool that it's sort of organic and fluid is because I get like, I'll get a professional tennis coach, I'll get a golf coach, I'll get a baseball coach, I'll get... Uh, uh, I'll just get somebody that's just loving training with the rope that's 65 and then I get like mm. a kid comes in and then I got like a fitness pro and like it's just such an assortment of people that come in where uh, we get dancers this is a big thing for me we get break dancers we get musicians oh, wow. that come in because there's a rhythm a musicality to what we do there's um there's this just this when you look at it you're kind of like man that actually kind of looks like what I do but Mm. so I feel like I need to learn more about that right and it's because we have those external cues that those coaches I think can start recognizing a little bit like oh wow that posture feels like it moves to the thing I'm trying to do a little better uh, rather than the I'm here and now in this little space in the gym doing my thing and internalizing it we're taking all that internal energy and putting it outward towards something and my personal practice with that, so everything I do, I have to have felt. Everything I tell you, or sorry, everything I tell you, I have to have felt. That's the type of coach I am. 
I have to have a personal practice in something to even give you any information on it. I had been in a lot of modalities, so I've explored a lot of the fitness industry. I had the, I spent time to do that early in my career. And I was getting frustrated with, I honestly was getting frustrated with liking so many modalities, but not being able to feel like I could keep the skill sets in all of them. Mm. It's frustrating. There's a lot of cool stuff in 2023 mm. in the fitness industry. There's lots of fun things you can do that can spark your interest. And if it's, if it's your diehard hobby in your career, like you're going to try to tap as many of them as possible, I think. And for me, this, this thought was the thing that really gave me like a central hub to spoke out to all of them and not feel like I'm losing anything skill set wise and also gaining strength and or whatever the modality required. I can kind of, I can be doing my kettlebell snatch and I can feel my freestyle stroke in the pool moving up. You know what I mean? Like two things, wet dry workouts, some, somebody wouldn't even think about really connecting. They try to, but I can sense that now I can feel the benefit because I'm allowing the body uh, to move a little differently than what I was putting that constraint on of not letting it move there type thing. Again, that not like, what if I should have been doing that type thing? So, um, and um, on a performance level, performance going up, but most importantly to me is like, I'm taking this information and like, I've given it to my hundred year old grandma. And mm. she like, she, last time I saw her, she was in, she was literally telling me about how she's like in PT and they're trying to help her with her balance and they have her trying to stand on one leg. And I'm like, Oh, that's really great. Like I'm excited. You're doing it, working on something. It's good to have like a physical task. And she's like, I still haven't been able to do it. And I was like, Oh, grandma, try this. And I just had her stand there and literally just gave her a different external thought and a different mm -hmm. position that she could try to stand on one leg. And she did it and she held it for a minute with just, wow. the, just a that's change awesome. of thought. And she's been going weekly to a place to try to get her to stand on one leg, telling her what she wasn't supposed to do to do it or something, you know? And I'm like, ah, man, like that's a lot of that person's life and time that she's at the end of that part of her life and time. And that hour becomes more and more valuable that she could spend with her loved ones and things like that and be working on things that she really wants to work on. And that is powerful times a really powerful thing and mm. everything we're trying to teach is just to maximize time it's we're work methods about efficiency it's biomechanical efficiency it's thought efficiency it's time efficiency it's everything it's being more efficient so we have time for for the to enjoy the carryover you know what i mean from the gym it sounds like there's a there's even a clinical application to what you're talking about. I mean, if yeah. you're talking about somebody who needed a PT to learn how to stand on one leg, which is a very common PT exercise, giving a different external cue. It sounds like it could be beneficial for clinicians as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have tons of PTs that get into this stuff. And this is where like me and David would be more of the thought, like trying to push forward the movement thought and like how you act, like how you do stuff, the physicality of it. And then as a company as a whole, we're trying to develop tools and products and things that like hold true to that thought as well and might spark the interest of that. So like PTs, they find our soul steps or our deck and they're like, oh, wow, like I use slant boards and I use something that sort of helps that. And I can see how that, that angle probably helps with the foot a little better. And that might be the thing that excites them to start getting into this information because they can give their client that practical, just stand on it. You know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. sometimes I, I think I was a carpenter for like 25 years of my life. I worked with tools and tools are such a valuable thing. And I think there was a little bit of a negativity towards tools in the fitness industry now, because yes, we can get the job done with our body weight, but guess what? Human beings love tools and we learn from tools. When you put something in your hands, there's a feel, there's a feedback, there's something to gain. It's the reason we pick up weights too. It's not just the load, like there's a feel. And we learn from that information. And then when we put that tool into action and challenge what it can do, we learn even more because we, we root it back into ourselves. So I think that, and it's just helpful as a coach to have more tools in your toolbox, right? Things that can like, oh man, this situation, this one's going to help this person learn it. So, and uh, I've been, um, I'm a big preacher on uh, trying to remove cueing a little bit, trying mm -hmm. to give people the opportunity to feel things more 
Because if you just keep dropping information into somebody that doesn't have a movement practice yet, they don't have that intuitiveness in their own body. They don't have that. Then I think uh, you're deciding what they're supposed to be feeling rather than what they're supposed to be feeling. So Mm. I'm big on my coaches. Like we, we talk about being coaches a little bit. Like I said, like our education is kind of cool. I think there's, there's more to it than just the information. Like you get to learn some new tools you get some great new movement thought. And then you also just see a more just ugh, like, it's okay just to be a coach and maybe just two people working together. And we're just trying to get information across to each other. And we just want both of us to feel better after the whole thing. So, right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, our motor, our motor learning in our infant stages, isn't through coaching. Right. I mean, we, we yeah. learn by making mistakes and then developing from those mistakes, which is a really important component for us to, Kind of let our even let our adults do learn learn yeah. by doing, and then be able to give them if we need to give them feedback, give them feedback, and, and yeah. just make sure they they have that intrinsic feel of whatever it is that you're trying to do. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm very inspired. I kind of mentioned this. We get some dancers coming to our courses now, and I think mm-hmm. I always feel like that's a good sign. I feel like dancers tend to not go into the fitness industry too much Mm because they don't feel like they can they don't feel like maybe they get the carryover they're looking for to perform better Mm -hmm. in what they do because it's such a complex thing and there's so much emotional expression and things that can be involved in that and i'm noticing a lot of that come in which is really great and that also speaks to that like i've been to some dance stuff and there's that the instructor will be like move like i feel They don't always tell you where to be. There is certainly some dance that has very uh, Mm -hmm. strict positioning, but there's a, there's a lot of feel behind it and they want you to feel it (laughs) and they want you to move how I'm feeling, like express what I'm feeling. And that's a lot of what ours is too, but we do it in the gym and it's a little different and it can have a little more constraint to it and progressive nature to it. And we can think about it for performance or we can think about it for like more clinician, like, trying PT work and things like that. We can, it's a broader area, I guess. So speaking to tools, so obviously you guys have three main tools that as, uh, as it, within the, the educational protocol that you do for that level one, which is the pulsers, the rope and resistance band. We yeah. talked a little bit about, you talked a little bit about the rope, how it kind of pulls you into those positions and you're learning. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the pulsers and the resistance band and how they actually fit within the, the concepts that you're, that you're talking about? Yeah, so I'll, I'll go through three real quick, briefly, just so you get it. So sure. in the order that I think it's most valuable. So uh, the course for us, uh, basically what we do is we, we teach a different way to use elastic resistance bands. That's a very ubiquitous, it's a tool that anybody can get from anybody. And mm-hmm. great if you get ours, but whatever. If you have one, you can start to practice right away. And what we do with that is we perform a, uh, a concept we call limit force elastics. So if you've ever just like pulled a something that you cannot pull apart, you create like an isometric type tension, right? Um, Like a rope, let's say if I pulled apart, but what would happen is if I let up at all, you would see that slack happen in the rope immediately and you would no longer be getting feedback from that tool. When we use an elastic and we like put it really close together and we pull it apart to the point that like, I can't spread it, but it's only a couple of inches. We heat, we uh, hit that, isometric sort of position we call it an expometric because essentially the elastic is trying to return right Mm -hmm. to its shape so you're getting that acceleration sort of factor that it's trying to return back to its shape so even if you're letting in and out of it you're constantly getting feedback from the tool so it ends up being a really great tool to learn like positional work and that's what we do at bands we do limit force elastics to develop positions and postures and that's where we start exposing people to our coiled position or that side bend position with the external cueing that makes it look more like those sort of athletic postures or positions. All right. So that's what we do with the bands and why we do it. Um, then we sort of take people through our rope practice. What that ends up being, aside from it just being an awesome modality and fun, uh, it sort of becomes this fluid expression of moving between that coiled position to the other coiled position. So it's this really soft, easy practice to start allowing yourself without too much tension, explore those positions in those ranges while also learning a skill set. And there's some other benefits like crossing the hands and 
all that for stimulating the brain and things like that you could really dive into and get into. But I'm more for the movement practice at that point for the beginner, right? Um, and then what that, uh, then basically what we do is from after that fluid practice or that swinging of a tool, we move into the pulsers and the pulsers, they're uh, th similar to our club. If you've ever seen our club, uh, they, they have shifting weight inside of them. What that means is there's steel shot inside of it. That's moving fluidly essentially through it. And what that does is that creates an audible information. Mm -hmm. And it also creates a force feedback sort of information when we're using it. And what's really great about that is I can remove some of the cueing as a coach and the tool can provide the cueing. So the tool is going to be a better te teacher on some of the nuanced positioning of things than I am watching you move through something very fast and complex. I can try to give you my best cues, but ultimately you're going to have to figure them out yourself, right? So that tool and that thought of audible feedback is going to be really helpful because there's a very distinct sound that you're going to get and that you're always going to be chasing that sound to be as crisp as possible. And that's going to tell you that things are most likely going well within yourself. And what's awesome about that is not behind the sound comes like an extra little, <clears throat> like a little spike of force that sort of reinforces the like, oh, that was it, <laughs> which is right. freaking awesome. So yeah. Right. And what, what that allows us to do is <clears throat> what you'll find is while we love the fluid behavior of the rope, it, because the tool is constant, it's limited in how you can move. There's a lot of great movement you can do in it, but you're still, you have to follow that line that the rope is moving on on that centrifugal force. You'll see this with the steel mace, the club, all this kind of stuff, that, or a bearing bag, even, even the kettlebell a little bit. There's, there's, you kind of follow the pendulum. Like you can't really change the direction rapidly. There has to be a thought or something to stop it. Um, this is where when we like put the pulsers in our hands, we're separating that thought now and we can move any way we want and we can get that force factor and that audible information to know I am where I need to be when I need to be. Um, and then that sort of opens up the door for us to do a lot of plyometric work. Um, it allows us to run with it and get some nice cueing, especially in the low intensity stuff when we just kind of bop our hands we start to develop that timing of the feet and the hands together. Uh, but for me, I love the, the, those guys for core work and for plyometrics. So it really helps. I'm really excited about it for what it does for the timing of landing. So mm. Dave's really big on the launch, the power, faster, stronger type thing. And I'm really big on the like feels better. I'm landing better. I'm setting up for things because now I have something to tell me to do that. Whereas I could finish the box jump and just stand there, but now I got my hands involved and constantly, I constantly feel like I want to keep reacting to them. Um, and uh, what I love about it is they teach, um, they teach an arm action that relates to running. So what you'll see uh, runners talk about like 90, 90, a lot with their hands, mm -hmm. they see cheek to cheek. But basically what they're saying with that 90 in the back is the elbow is really high in back and not throwing the hand. You're trying to keep it a little mm -hmm. more proximal. The pulsers really emphasize that behavior because if the arm goes, you end up making like a sloshy sound with them, if you would, mm -hmm. instead of like a very precise, sharp pulse, if you would. Yeah. Gotcha. What, how would you guys, so this is a question. So I'll, we hear, you mentioned core a little bit. You meant mm -hmm. obviously that coiling, that side bend. How do you guys define the core itself? You you hear it from lots of different people. What is the core for you guys? What what do you guys define it as? Yeah, so the the core for us is the engine. You can look into something um, uh, Gravetsky's spinal engine theory. You can get into a little bit of the counter rotation if you want to dive into that book. That's a nightmare. Don't do that. But if you want to, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a, I don't know what you'll get from it, but <laughs> but go for it if you want to just see it. Uh, just people with the thought of counter rotation of the core. So the trunk, I believe that the trunk is the engine. It's the thing that drives everything. And for us, we work on four quadrants of it. We sort of look at the external oblique on each side. And then we look at like the QL or the fascial lat on the back side of the body. And uh, I... I always uh, will just tell, I, I play around with something called torsion. I've mentioned that once before this, 
I got a lot of that information sort of uh, from a gentleman named Julian Pinal, his business called Strong Fit. I believe he's an ex like French strongman or something like that. And he, he plays around with this idea that sagittal work is rotational work via torsion. Uh, he's not talking about the locomotive stuff and all that, but I've got a lot of information from that. So I always like to give him credit there. Um, the, um, the core for me though, with all that thought process, it's knowing that and the strength of it, but then how it moves fluidly through distal behavior. So in the education we teach proximal. So I teach like if I had no arms or legs, I want to see what this thing can do and how it functions and how I root to it. And then when you start getting into the hands and the elbows and all this, things start getting really complicated because there's a lot of different ways you can do things and get the same result. Mm. And there's different paths you can take. But what I look at when I see really complex behavior is I'm always looking back to see what the trunk is doing. And you'll see that there are, there are not very many combinations of things that it can do, but there are tenfold of what it can do when it's outside, like th what the distal behavior do. And I think a lot of people, that, especially as it gets into like performance things and sports and nuanced sports and niche sports and these things pop up and you start, you'll start seeing like a lot of thought come out on what's right and things like that and what to train. And they'll be talking about all this distal stuff, but you'll start seeing people get uprooted from their engine or their trunk or the thing that I think provides the carryover. This, uh, the trunk is the thing that sort of is the connecting point to other modalities. So if I want my baseball to make me better in my elderly age and walking and functioning, then I need to make sure I'm rooting my baseball to this type thing. Right. And uh, of course we go over all the thought on that and like how it was which ones would sort of make most sense for specific tasks. And, and I, po I open up the opportunity for everybody to be creative and thought and take the information and apply it how they feel like they need to apply it. Cause I think that's really the, the special piece of it, but the core is it, man. It's the primary. I don't want it to ever be put. I want it moving. And I want, even when we're doing uh coiling where we're doing like these isometric sort of side bends that would be our bracing is when we're in a coil if you want to call it bracing i don't think it's really bracing but it, for me what it is is it's i'm finding the end end range of rotation so mm. like the end range of mo uh, motion it's the end range of rotation and i can hold in it and i can stay poised in it and when you find that position you find a lot of opportunity a lot of athletic opportunity for sure and if you can picture this, like I like to give the example, my favorite one, most athletic sport out there, bowling. <laughs> if you watch somebody hold off to the side, they sort of side bend to one side. They take a couple steps while they're in that side. And then they transition to the other side when they release the ball. It's like this, it's this moment where you start recognizing like, wow, him staying in the, him, her, whatever, them staying in that side. They, uh, they have athletic poise and they're waiting for the opportunity <laughs> to let it go. Mm. The wait for it moment. That's a common term in a lot of athletics, the wait for it, right? That patience. And it, it defies the natural behavior to move from side to side, taking a step to step. When you walk, you shift your weight, right? You shift your weight left and you sort of will get this little natural sort of cycle to yourself to keep it moving. Right. But when we can coil, we sort of break the cycle because my brain says this is going to give me opportunity to balance. And um, the first place I ever actually felt it and really dove into this stuff prior to Dave that I can really root back to now is as a carpenter, my, my life of just being a carpenter, <laughs> excuse me, I had to carry um, plywood all the time. And when you carry large ob objects, you try to get them as close to your center line as possible. And you end up being long and short and you create this position that we're talking about. And I've had to traverse distance with that and upstairs and balancing across a roof or whatever you're doing, you know? So, but it, it, it's what made me level-headed and it kept me poised and kept me balanced. Right. So, so it sounds like uh, from what we've talked about this court, the course, the mm -hmm. entry level course with you guys uh anybody can go to you guys get like a whole 
like cascading group, uh, cornucopia, if you will, of people <laughs> that come in and out of those courses. What is the main thing you want the people who take the course to walk away from? What's the main idea that you guys want to, to take home? So the, the big thing for me, I want, there's three things in the course I really want you to learn. I want you to learn the rotational language. So how we're defining rotation, that's super important to me so that you understand the positions uh, and feel those positions. So you need to feel that. I need you to feel that so you can develop that personal practice, right? Uh, the second thing, I want you to learn all of our tools because our tools are cool and they help amplify that rotational language and they help the learning process of it. So they help teach it quicker. So you can apply it to the, the reason you go get education or information. You either want to put it in your own practice or you want to give it to other people or both, right? So that uh, learning those tools to help onboard that practice quicker. And then um, I talk about programming. So that's the other thing. So I talk about implementation. So the how we implement it. And I've come up with a cool little ratio that I think is super simple that meets that cornucopia, if you will, of people coming in. So that if you do West Side Barbell or you do CrossFit or you are a swim coach or something, how do I get everything you just told me into my programming? And I think it would be a shame for me to be like, it's this, 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 rather than say, here is a way to implement it into what you already do and what you already love. And I want you to think about it. I want you to be a coach and I want you to think and challenge and challenge movement as somebody told you it and see that there are branches of it and ways and opportunities in there. And I want to make you a better coach and sort of lift you up to that standard and give you that confidence again as a coach to keep things moving forward type thing. So, yeah, so you're coming, you're, you're learning my language just because we got to talk the same language. You're learning my tools. And you're coming to learn how to implement all that stuff. So, and uh, because we're organic and fluid, the event, sometimes they can get real fun. If we got people that are interested in certain modalities, I'm a pretty physical person. I'm a pretty capable person. So I will demonstrate and I'll show. And sometimes I'll teach things sort of off the curriculum, if you will, and dive into things. We show kettlebell stuff sometimes. I definitely try to show all this stuff used with ubiquitous tools, kettlebells, dumbbells. We may get into barbells, things like that. So that's kind of the the thought of the education. <laughs> That's really cool. I love, I you know, the big thing that I'm walking away from this conversation with you, besides I was already impressed with you. Now I'm further impressed and further impressed with the method. I love that you make it practical for people and it's for everybody, which is incredible. The inclusivity of the education, which I think is the most important factor. I yeah. love hearing the inclusivity. If, if somebody wanted to sign up for the course, where could they find the course to sign up for? Yeah, right now, best place to go is to WECmethod.com. We got a little tab, I think that says training. You'd see, we actually have this course we've been talking about today. We have a live version and an online version. So people all around the world can tap into that and do it at your own pace. Um, and I'm the guy that grades it. So we have like a little submission on it. So you're going to get, you're still going to get my hands on your education and your experience in it. Uh, and then the live events, uh, I think we have them up till August right now. We try to run one once a month at least. And uh, and we alternate usually having one in San Diego. So if you want to come to the lab home base, we love that. But uh, I'm also trying to get around uh, at least the U.S. right now. And then um, I do have some master coaches elsewhere, uh, Korea. So if anybody happens to be tapping in from Korea, um, I got June and Johnny in Korea at Full Grip Gym. They're They're hosting courses now. And they're popping. So it's going to be a great place if you're listening in from there. So that's awesome. Well, uh, Chris, thank you so much for being on the show. I look forward to continuing to follow you, continuing to follow Wack Method. Thank you for all the work that you're doing, man. And I really appreciate you being on today. Yeah, appreciate you, Jesse. It was awesome. Thanks for the opportunity.